This morning, we come to the communion table. We are going to read from Matthew 26, verses 26 to 30. And this is where Jesus is at the end of the Last Supper. And it says, While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Taste and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink all from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung in him, they were not the man of God. Think about that event. Jesus, knowing what he was going to do, being fully God and fully man, knowing that he was on his way to the cross and the uh, the abuse that he would endure for the next couple of days. I have the presence to say, this is what's coming, and I'm going to lay down my life. Remember this. And think of the joy. So I am convinced that joy is such a needed part of our brain science. Think of the joy that Jesus will feel when he eats and drinks of this again in his kingdom and we are with him. Lord, thank you for that. I pray today that as we take communion, that we would ponder how grateful we are for your sacrifice. Lord, that we would look into your face and see the joy that you have as you await us being with you in your kingdom to take this again. Thank you for that. Help us, Lord, to not get to just to grade over that, but to be present in what it is that you're doing in this moment. We pray in the name of Jesus.
Suffering and brutal death. So, I, this I think is more relevant to us in our society in America today than it would have been 20 years ago. But I want to take some time here because there's a couple of points that we need to kind of focus on here. So, people like angels and mystical things so much because they're spiritual, but they don't require anything of us. Or call us to commitment and to change. People love to be spiritual, but not truly godly, so that involves real change. Let's talk about the difference between spiritual and godly for a minute. Knowing who or what God means to an individual is important when we're having conversations with them. And I'll take this real quick, just a quick review, a quick um, understanding here. So, who is God according to different religions? In theism, we, which is what we believe, God is the creator and the sustainer of the universe. In deism, God is the creator but not the sustainer of the universe. In pantheism, God is the universe itself. Atheism is an absence of belief in any God or deity, while the agnostic being the existence of God unknown or unknowable. So, what is your belief in God, and where is Jesus in relation to this? So, when we start talking to people about spiritual or godliness, this foundation has to be established. And we have to understand from their perspective, is it big G God? Is it a small G God? Do they pray? I was talking to a guy not too long ago that was saying that he was, he was in a conversation with a, a guy that he works with. And he asked the guy, you know, what do you believe? And he said, well, I pray to myself. I'm like, okay, that is not something that I have heard before, but that's the way he believes. So we have to understand where we are in the conversation with people so that we can actually have a biblically-based conversation with them about who Jesus is and that we understand, are they spiritual or are they godly? So spiritual, need to be up on the screen. Spiritual. As a part of our triune makeup, something we creatively desire. Now, if you've been with us for a while, you know that I love to make up words. And so, creatively, the flag on my spell set, because it's not a real word, but it expresses an idea that as creation, and as we are created to be spiritual in a creatively way, we're desiring. Something spiritual. Spiritual, defi- spiritual defined as relating to, consisting of, or affecting the spirit of or relating to supernatural beings or phenomena. Relating to or affecting the human spirit or soul as opposed to material or physical things. So let's look here at the second definition. Supernatural beings are phenomena that's spiritual. Okay. We look at the third one: the human spirit or soul, as opposed to material and physical. So here, the third one is very gnostic in its approach. It's, it's combining soul and spirit in one, and saying basically we're buying in. 
that the soul and the spirit are one, but we want to be spiritual. And so this all is kind of a glom, it's kind of a conglomerate of all the things that we want to experience. And that's what spiritual is. God, we would define this as seeking after Him to do His will. And it costs something. When you define God, the definition is conforming to the laws and the wishes of God, obeying and respecting God, showing great reverence for God. That's very different than spiritual. That is ascribing to the Creator, the God Most High, reverence, awe, trying to become like Him. It requires something of us to be godly. It doesn't require anything of us to be spiritual. So why are we talking about this here? If we're only spiritual, the world doesn't care or rebel against that. Satan is spiritual. If we're godly and biblical in our approach, which requires us to repent of and turn away from sin, live according to His ways, follow His instructions and sacrifice, we are now in people's business. We're asking them to change. We're setting a standard for what we believe. And often they don't like that. Hence, don't be surprised if the world hates you. Okay. Or through one verse. <laughs> so this is uh, this is important for us to understand this because this is what happens in our in our society very often. I was talking to a guy a couple weeks ago, and he said, "See, somebody told me they were spiritual, but they weren't interested in religion." And I said, "I don't understand that," and that's kind of where this came from. Verse fourteen. We know that we pass from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. This is a self-test. We talked about this in uh, a couple of messages back. There's a couple of self-tests to see if we're on the right path. So this is one of the self-tests. How does one know if they're a believer? To be unable to love means that a person is without spiritual life and remains in death. We have passed from death, our born state, to life in Christ Jesus. We were dead to sin, and we are now alive in Christ. So, listen to this quote. Love will not cause one's passage to spiritual life. It will give evidence of it. So, love doesn't, love's not exclusive to us, but it gives evidence that we have passed from death to life. Remember, we know a lot, but we live what we believe. And so, if you want to know how you're loving and what you believe about that, look at how you live. Get back your actions. Verse 15. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This reference is back to the Mount of Mount. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. You have heard that it was said to people long ago, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. John here, okay, he was there, at some of the mount, he heard all of that, and John here is making a reference and linking murder and hatred, and it's a reference back to Cain. He saw that coming. So he's saying, hate has to be despised, and murder is the fulfillment of that attitude. That's what happened with Cain. So in the, in a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about don't be like Cain. This is what he's talking about. Cain hated Abel because Abel's fact or Abel's offering was accepted by God, and Cain's was not. Now, if you go back and read Genesis 4, it says, so God told Cain, he said, don't you know that if you present an acceptable offering, you will be accepted. But be aware, sin is crossing at your door in order to have you. And so there's always this opportunity for sin, for hate to come in, for it to, to become all kinds of things. And the Lord's saying, be careful, sin is crossing at your door. You have to make sure that you're not doing things that allow that in. It's crossing at your door to take you over. 
And so we need to be aware of that and know that our actions make a difference. When righteousness is exhibited, evil will want to kill us. Don't be surprised if the world hates you. When righteousness is exhibited, evil will want to kill us. Remember, sin is always crashing at the door, and there are eternal implications for these children for the church. Verse 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. In this verse, John is contrasting the negative example of pain to the positive example of Jesus. This is how we know what love is laying down his life for brothers and sisters. Jesus' life was not taken from him. He freely gave it for us. And because of Jesus' sacrifice, because of his love for us, eternity was opened up to each one of us. That was before Jesus. That was not an option. Jesus, because of his death, resurrection, his sacrifice on the cross, and being raised to life, gives us the opportunity to be again in a relationship with God for eternity. The demand for love arises from his commandment, and the meaning of love is found in his example. So the command for love arises from his command. He says, love one another, and then he says, you have to do it. Thanks be to God. This is not some, some knowledge-based, I love this thing. This is not some knowledge-based, gnostic understanding of an emotional concept. This is Jesus laying down his life and saying, this is what it costs. This is not mental offense to something smart. It's not a gnostic way of, if I have enough information, then I can get there. This is an acceptance of the truth of what Jesus did for us. It is putting as he's asking us to put our lives on the line and follow the example of Jesus, both in word and deed. Love is denial of self for another's gain, and that is selfless and hard. That's what we have to do. This is godly and not just spiritual. So we're making a distinction here, and I want to make this very clear. Godliness requires stuff of you. It requires that we actively are pursuing God to become more like Him, not just have our spirit placated by some, some phenomenon or spiritual experience that may or may not be God. Jesus did what he did for us, and then he asked us to follow him, his way. He did not die for us that we could become spoiled brats and live gnostically dualistic lives. He died for us so that we could become more like him, and we could be in relationship with God, and that the Holy Spirit it gives us some conviction to our hearts and we go, I shouldn't be like that. I need to become more like Jesus in this way. A pastor from Oxford named Vaughn Roberts put it this way, when you love people who are like you, that's ordinary. When you love people unlike you, that's extraordinary. When you love people who dislike you, that's revolutionary. That's the kind of love John is calling us to and the kind of world the kind of love the world is waiting to see. Verses 17 and 18. What does love look like? If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and truth. Love is very practical according to God. It's not words, it's actions. It's doing the right thing. giving ourselves every day. It's doing good for people in ordinary ways, not just in action, but in truth, asking the hard questions that call for holiness and godliness. So when we are in conversation, and even as we have conversation after the message, godliness is saying, are you being true here? Are you all the things that you need to, to address in your own life? And, and we'll have those conversations in a little bit. This should be a way to distinguish between godly community and worldly community. The ability to ask and have honest conversations to address issues. 
It can also include being aware of our permissive sin. So, how is the toes being stepped on here? We all have them. What is a permissive sin? These are the areas that reside between the Ten Commandments and love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. As we become more like God, the least that we have from the Lord becomes shorter. When we're first saved, we can do a whole bunch of stuff. And then as we start to become more like God, he starts to rein us in a little bit and go, you know, you may not want to do that because that's going to keep you from my presence. You may want to be aware of this because that doesn't look like my nature and character. And so, as we become more like God, because we want to be like Him, because we want to be in His presence, and being in His presence is a privilege, not a right, as we be aware of some of these permissive things. David understood this. In Psalm 51, he writes, Do not pass me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. David had messed up. And I'm not talking about little. You go back, you can read the, the context here. And he's asking the Lord. He knows that he has been anointed by God. But he messed up in a way and said, God, please forgive me. I did it wrong. And please don't take your presence from me because that's what I want to be on. So here's one that uh, permits us to we have to be aware of. How is your online presence? Is this a permissive sin? So I want to talk physiology just for a minute. When we encounter some issues, our heart rate can go above 100, and chemicals can be released into our blood that shuts down our prefrontal cortex, our reasoning center, and puts us in a fight or flight mode, a reaction and self preservation mode. We may feel justified as we match their tone online, but that does not reflect the nature and character of Christ. And so, this, this sometimes falls into the permissive sin category. And we go, well, I, I, I can do that because it's, it's online, don't you think? Listen, listen. Often, we react here, and sometimes we have to go on an apology tour because we have been taken over and we have reacted in a way that does not reflect the nature and character of God. Remember, you don't have to defend what you didn't say. And you just have to be quick to be aware. As we work towards loving one another, as we work towards um, seeing other people and helping them in this context, we need to make sure that we honor one another. Honor something we're trying to really establish here as a, a mode for our church. We need to serve one another. We talked about all the one another uh, a number of weeks ago. And so how do we love one another? How do we serve one another? How do we become more like Jesus? So again, back to the commentary. If we, could, if, if we are in a position to see with our own eyes someone's need, for example, good Samaritan, and did not offer help, then we cannot do other, otherwise than us. To withhold help in such a situation is to shut off compassion, action, and deny the presence of God love in our own hearts. Kindness doesn't cost, it pays. And so when we see things, how do we react? How do we do it? Are we out of front and doing what it is that the Lord wants us to do as we serve one another? And this is part of loving one another. When you disappoint someone who loves you deeply, they love you anyway. So instead of punishing you, they forgive. And they forgive you a couple of times. They're patient with you. They give you a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance, however many it takes. That's how God loves us. And that's how we love one another. We are to love one another. So this gives us freedom. Freedom for what? Freedom from guilt? Okay. But here's what it gives us freedom for. When we're in that kind of loving community, when we exhibit that, when you're loved like that, you're free to make mistakes. You're free to disagree. You're free to take a risk. You're free to be yourself. 
That's why love is the greatest gift we can give one another, because it gives us the freedom to become the people we long to be and we're meant to be in Christ. Last week, we talked for a few minutes about uh, a couple of questions. We'll get there in a second. We talked about being pigeonholed. So I was fascinated by that concept, and I looked up what pigeonhole means. To pigeonhole someone is to classify them without considering their qualities and characteristics. So if you remember the story about Doug coming home in 84 or 85 and us pigeonholing him, not considering the growth that he had attained in his own life, I was trying to make him something that he used to be. That wasn't well on our part. That's something that we need to be doing here in our church as well. And say, how are you, what are you doing now? What's important to you now? What's the Lord doing in your heart? And not go, well, for this long a time, you used to be that. We don't want to see what people used to be. We want to give them the opportunity to become what it is the Lord is asking them to become. And finally, verse 18. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in love. And truth. Love requires more than idle talk or his relative theology. This is not a deep theological message. It's a simple and challenging one to allow, hopefully to allow this to take root in our heart and to challenge our current thinking of how we're living. So let's go in that understanding and do what it's right. So we've got some questions for this morning. How do you respond to godly versus spiritual? Are there things that you have noticed in your culture, in your own life? And so maybe some discussion around those things, understanding that spiritual, people want to be spiritual, but do they want to be godly? The second one is last week we talked about what can I do, what should I do, or what must I do? Have you impacted you this week? Because those questions revolve around original design. What must I do? Or why did you create me? And what things are you asking me to become? Because I want all that you have for me. I don't want to be stuck somewhere else and somewhere short of that. And thirdly, what are a few tangible ways this week you can commit to in showing true love to those around you? 